September 14th, 2019. Destiny Oliver is five years old, 56 pounds, 88 inches, was shot and killed. So I want to shift for a second 
and I want to talk about the other things that we absolutely know in this case. Because I submit to you that the defendant has told so many stories, so many stories, so many different stories, that you're not going to be able to rely on what she says happened that night. You can't. She's told too many stories for it to be reasonable for you all to believe what she said. <clears throat> so let's start with what we absolutely know in this case. You all watched the video in this case, the video from the neighbor's camera. And it was grainy and it was kind of boring and we watched it for a long time. I'm sure it wasn't the most dynamic or interesting part of this case. But that video, ladies and gentlemen, is very important, very important. And the reason the video is important is because it establishes that there are people there, and there are people going in and out of that house. And it also establishes how long the people are in the house and how many times they go. So that's why we're going to start with that. So the video that you watched, if you'll recall, there is a car that arrives at the beginning of that video. And I'm not going to make you watch it. Watch the whole thing here again, because you guys have already done that. You will have that video back in the jury room. You may watch it at your pleasure as many times as you want during the operation. <laughs> but what we saw in that video was that there was a car that arrived at 829.38, then leaves at 831.08, and then you can see that there's a car that arrives at 841.04, and that's going to be this car, the one with the green arrow in it up on the screen. And that car, we don't know if it's the same car as this one or if it's a different car. But we know that, that person that was in the car sat there with their lights on from 841.04 until later on. And we'll get to that. So the next thing that happens, the next part of the video that's important is this part that I have up on the screen. This portion of the video is whenever the defendant, Robin Howington, gets to the house. And she gets there at 842.43. So when she's there, that vehicle is waiting for that's uncontroverted. That's what happened. And we know that because a neighbor happens to have a video that shows this. The next thing that you see on that video is that Destiny then walks inside the house. She goes first. She walks in at 842, excuse me, 843.28. She walks inside her home. It's kind of the last time that this little girl goes into her home. And she's followed quickly thereafter by Miss Howington, who is carrying it. So Destiny goes in, Miss Howington goes in. And then there are several minutes that this person who is in this car is sitting outside. It's not a situation where that person comes and helps her with the kids, or helps her in, or just gives her money real quick because they owe her for a car tinted window. No, oh, that person waits. And they wait several minutes for her to get in with her children. 8.46.05. You might have to watch the video more than one time. It's a little difficult to see. You will see right before 8.46.05 that the door is closed right here, and at 846.05, there's activity, and that door is open. And I submit to you what's happening there. So Ms. Howington is calling that person, okay, it's okay now to come into my house. And then the person in the car walks up to the house and goes in. You all will see in that video, you've already seen, the individual goes in at 846.43 and remains in that house till 847.47, which is 63 seconds. 63 seconds. And the reason that's important, ladies and gentlemen, is because the defendant doesn't know about this video when she's talking to the police initially. The defendant doesn't know that the comings and goings of the people at the house has been reported. So that would really be any testimony, any testimony about when Ms. Howington knew that video. Is this just my own argument? Ms. Howington. It's got to be within the record. 
Okay, your objections, ma'am. Until the second interview, when the police come in with their laptops, they have to and show her portions of that video. When she makes her initial statements, she has no idea that what happened at that house has been recorded and that there's only 63 seconds that this person is in there. And that's important. That's important. Because it shows that her stories about what's happening inside the house are not true. Are not true. She can't come into this courtroom and say, oh, there's this fight with Anton, and there's this big struggle with the gun, and all these things that are happening. She can't say that anymore. It's not true, first of all. But it's not backed up by the video that you all were able to see because the neighbor happened to have a video camera next door to 502 Pulse and Drive. You all saw in that video that that person comes in calmly, walks away calmly. And what's the next thing that happens? The defendant exits her home. She does that at 8.48.52. She leaves her home. She leaves her two children inside her house, unattended, which is fine to do, unless you have a loaded firearm in a place where a child can easily access. She moves her car, you all saw that on the video. She moves her car, takes a couple minutes to do that, and then she goes back inside. After she gets in the home, there's about three minutes before she calls 911. Here is the portion of the video where she is calling 911. And this is important to you. It's important because when she calls 911, what is she doing? What are her actions? <coughs> First of all, it's important to note that when she calls 911, her reaction to her child that has just been shot and who is mortally wounded, her reaction to that is not to get on the phone and tell the 911 operator exactly what's happened. Her 
her choice, her decisions, <coughs> her actions, her words to the 911 operator are lies. She decides. This detective doesn't make her say anything to 911. Detective Warwell doesn't make her say anything to 911. Ms. Howington is responsible for her actions and for her words. And her immediate response to her child being shot in the chest, her immediate response is to get on the phone and call 911 and start spinning a story. Start blaming it on someone else. And why? Why? Ask yourself, why would she do that? Ms. Howington lies to 911 and spins this web of lies because she's trying to protect Gavin. She does these things because she's trying to protect herself. She's trying to protect Robin Howington. And she knows right away when she's on the phone with 911, right away that leaving her gun out and allowing her children access to her gun is her fault. And it's tragic, ladies and gentlemen. You will not hear the state say that she purposely shot her child or she wanted this to happen. That's, that's not what we're saying to you. What we are saying to you, and what the proof shows in this case, is that Destiny died because of her negligence. This was an avoidable death. And Ms. Howington is responsible for the death of this child, as sad as it is. <coughs> so let's talk about this now on call. What I'm going to show you is the clip of the house outside synced with the 911 call. Call one. On Saturday, September 14, 2019, at 8.53 p.m., with a GMC offset of negative 204 no. minutes, agent ID extension to 202. I apologize for that. I have not been shown this demonstrative piece that is linking two separate incidents so that I could test myself whether or not it's correctly linked up. It's final argument. Both of these pieces of evidence are in the record. I rule. <coughs> On Saturday, September 14, 2019, at 8.53 p.m., with a GMT offset of negative 240 minutes, agent ID is extension to 202. Thank you. 
Talk about this 911 call. So, in the 911 call, as I said, her first reaction immediately after this happens is to blame this on someone else. She blamed it on an unknown black male that came into the house and shot her drunk. And she says on the stand yesterday, but the reason that all these lies comes out is because she wants to protect Gavin. Let's talk about that for a second. She wants to protect Gavin. What does that mean? She doesn't want Gavin to know, she says, that he shot his sister. Does that really make sense? Does that really make sense? First of all, Gavin's two years old. There's one of two things that are going to happen. He's either going to remember this or he's not. If Gavin remembers what happened, there's nothing she can say or do that's going to change that. If Gavin doesn't remember, he gets older and he doesn't remember this. She can talk to him about it. She can decide that big family secret, we're not going to talk about it. He never knows about it. Or she can decide to tell him the truth about what happened. Say to him, Gavin, you were two years old. There was a gun that was not secured in the house that you brought. This is my fault. She can say that. That's not what she chooses to do. She doesn't want to take responsibility for her actions. She absolutely doesn't. And her course of conduct from the 911 call forward blatantly shows blatantly shows that Ms. Howington does not want to take any responsibility for anything that happened to her. Any responsibility. Instead, not only does she lie to the 911 operator, she gets rid of the gun. She hides this gun. This gun that was used to shoot her. She takes it outside the child on the phone with 911 while her daughter is in the house having been shot. It's more important for her to leave that house 
and to put that gun outside in the dark. And you can see the gun in this picture. Remember the officer testified because he has a really bright light on his hand. Those first set of pictures where he's come around that corner, you can see just how dark it is. Just how dark it is back in that corner of the house, the side of the house. She takes this gun that was used to shoot this little girl. Her first reaction is to take this gun and take it outside and hide it under a bush. She's conscious of her own body. She knows that she is an honor. Officer Cummings gets there at 8.56.15. You all recall from his testimony that he approached uh, cautiously because he <coughs> knew there was a shooting and he didn't really know very many more details about what was happening. You all remember he was in our second witness that we had the testimony. Officer Cummings testified that he got to the house, approached the door cautiously, and that he went inside. He says that when he went inside, that he sees the defendant sitting on the couch. And he says, has anybody been shot? What's going on? her mindset, a lot about what she's thinking, her deception, her lies. They are not, as the defense attorney wants you to believe, something that is caused by these officers in this case. They happen before anybody even gets there. And they continue from the point where she calls 911 the whole way up to the end of the last day. She is not truthful about what happened. Why? Why is she not truthful? Again, it's because she knows that she's responsible. She was negligent. She speaks to officers as they arrive on the scene. This is uh, one of the officer's videos that you heard on the playlist portion where she's describing. black car there with dark tinted windows. So she begins this weave of trying to look for this other person who killed her child. This unknown person that's coming to the house and they have a black car that has tinted windows. And you know what? When she told that to Detective Riddle and she talked about how she's sitting on the couch and she's looking the whole way down and she can see through the dark the whole way to the car and she can describe that it's a black Chrysler and it has dark tinted windows, he thinks, well, you know what? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't ring true. 
he believes at this point in time that he has a grieving mother. But he also is aware that what she's saying doesn't make sense. Doesn't make any sense. And he gives her the benefit of the doubt. He asks her, tell, tell me more information about this unknown individual that's come into your house. And she does. She provides additional details about this person. But this detective, obviously, when in this house and faced with this statement that this woman has seen through the first room, through the second room, out the door, out through the dark, to a car that she says is, is out there, and she can describe it as a black Chrysler with dark tinted windows, because it doesn't make any sense. And it's not true. It's not true. We know that now. It's not true. What does she say to Detective Rilla? Oh, they're all in there. We're just trying to get rid of them. We don't have to have a rock to do. When you say you all, it's you. Uh, you all heard all? Yes. Okay, you're in here. And the door was open like it is now. Okay. And what happened? And he just came in here. And we were all sitting right there. Where's he? I don't know who he is. You don't know who this guy is? I don't have a clue. I've never seen him in my life. And he walks in here. Will you show me just like no? Yes. Is there a lie? on the couch. I was sitting right beside her. He was sitting right here. I was sitting right here. She was laying right here. And he just shot. And then it was like he was surprised. I don't know if he was trying to shoot me or what, but he shot her. Well, where were you sitting? I was right here. And she's right here? Right here. Right here. She was laying down right here. And you, you were sitting down the whole time he comes in and pulls the judge? Yes. I didn't even realize he was in here until it was already. And, and, and what happened? What, how many times did you hear him shoot? Just one time. One time. And what, when, when he shot, what happened? Did he say anything? Nothing. He looked, he looked like he was surprised because she just went limp. So again, her statement there to Detective Brittle gives details about this event that happened that absolutely didn't happen. She provides, and then later on she tells him, you know, I look down the hallway and I can see that this black car with tinted windows. And more importantly, more importantly, what else does she say to Detective Girl? I think it was meant for me. I think it was meant for me. So the fact that these officers are investigating this case as if it's a homicide is not just because they want to do that. Her actions and what she says. That's why they're investigating this case like a homicide. She's transported to UT Hospital. What's she doing on the way to UT Hospital? She's texting Callie. If I need you to get that gun, Callie, for real, ASAP. It's on the side by the air conditioner, in the bush. My phone is about to die. They are taking me to UT. Just texting her boyfriend and saying, go get that gun. That is what is most important for her at this period of time when she's on the way to the hospital. Because again, self-preservation. She knows she's done something. She texts Joe P. Go to my house, the back way and get my gun out of the bush under the air conditioner. <coughs> Gavin shot Destiny, then come to UT, and I got you for free. She's gonna give him some pills for free for doing this for her. The police are there, but if you park in the alley and walk up, you're good because they are in the house. And she's calling, you can see in the call log, she's calling a bunch of other people. But her, her main goal there is to make sure somebody goes and gets that gun. <coughs> And she knows that these text messages are in her phone. And then she also makes a phone call. And you're going to hear her say, can you do that, please? Can you do what I just text you? You all will recall his testimony. He says he remembers receiving a phone call. He couldn't hear what she was saying, but 
but this is the call that she made. And she's saying, can you do that, please? Can you do what I just texted you? And what she's just texting him is to go get the gun and avoid the police while you're doing that. We get to UT Hospital now. And again, the state is not saying that this is something that's not true. But what we are saying is that her actions, her actions that day, are very clearly showing that she is conscious of her wrongdoing. She knows that she has been negligent. And she is desperate at this point in time for the police not to figure out what's going on. She's so desperate, ladies and gentlemen that when she's in the bathroom, she tries to give her phone to a complete stranger. To Marty Sands, she tries to give her her phone. She stands outside the, hall, the, the stall. You all remember Marty Sands. She stands outside the stall and waits for her to come out and says, take my phone. Take my phone. Marty Sands is like, oh, I'm not gonna do that. So what does the defendant do after that? She runs her phone under the wall. Breaks her phone. She wants to say, Oh, my phone was broken before, and that's fine. Even taking her at her word, at a minimum, she took her phone, tried to give it to a stranger, and then ran it underwater. Because she knows what's on these text messages, ladies and gentlemen. She doesn't want the police to know that she's tried to hide the gun. She's done this and messed it up so much that Officer Pate, who had to come and testify, had to reconstruct it, let it dry out for, for hours, put a new screen on the phone before he could look into the phone and see what was there. She continues with this. Next thing that we know that happened is that Matt, Ms. Howington is taken to police station. She is in an interview room and she is now going to explain what's going on there at the house. So I want to go through her stories because I submit to you that her stories change constantly. Constantly. Let's start with who shot Destiny. Let's talk about her different stories about who shot Destiny. And remember, the reason this is important because the reason she has all these different stories is because she wants to deflect anything from showing that she is responsible. That is her goal in talking to the police that day, is to deflect from what she has done. And so she blames multiple people, multiple people, for this shooting. In fact, on that one call, I'm not going to play again, but you heard she says, this dude was just at my house, and her words, and my fucking daughter just got shot. He was black. He's in a black Chrysler. I had a man that just came to the fucking door. He came in here, and he shot my daughter. That's her first story. Her statement to Detective Riddle, which we just played. He just came in here, and we were all sitting right there. I don't know who he is. I don't have a clue. I've never seen him in my life. She was laying on the couch. I was sitting right beside her. He, meaning Gavin, was sitting right here. I don't know if he was trying to shoot me or what, but he shot her. I didn't realize he was in here until it was already too late. Those are her two stories, the two things that she says before the investigators speak to her. And then she comes into the interview room. She comes into the interview room and she talks to the detectives in this case, and this is what she says. We can get that done with you. You tell us the truth and be helpful with us. Right? I told you, we just came home from the park and I thought somebody was following me. And so I went down the alley, there's the alley in between the neighbors where you took Gavin, or where you, whoever took Gavin, and nobody followed me. And then I didn't think nothing about it. She was laying on the couch, I turned Netflix on for her, and Gavin was sitting right beside me, I have a roast, still cooking right now in the crock pot. I was getting ready to make the plates. And somebody came to the door and I was sitting on the, whatever you want to call it, the footrest. 
And she was like this far away from me, laying there, because I was asking her, what else do you want? Because the only thing I had in the crock pot was uh, the roast and carrots. And I let them choose what they want to eat because her dad is a vegan. And so she's somewhat picky about what she eats. And I didn't even hear the door open because it was just the screen door. I had the other door still open because my purse was in the car still because I had to carry Gavin in because he didn't have shoes on. So whoever, all thing I seen was a black dude come in and I heard a gunshot and then I looked at my baby and then I looked at him and his eyes got big as I don't know what. Like I feel like it was big for me. What kind of car did it in? It was a black Chrysler. I'm almost sure it was. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I could see like out the door from where the foot thing was. So you never went outside to see the, the car? No, I got a towel. I got a towel and put it on her. That's her first story. <clears throat> Next, she starts talking about these kids at the park. In her words, this may be something. Let's see what she says. This may be something, she tells the detectives. Yes. Did y'all leave the park? Well, actually, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, these three boys, there's like a, this may be something, I don't know. But these three Mexican boys, there's like a fence or whatever, and there's like a bench right beside the fence. And they kept on crawling over it, going to this building that's right beside of the park. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. So the boys were making comments about my breasts. So I said, you guys aren't old enough to be talking to me like this, especially in front of my kids. I was like, you're already teaching my son bad things because he's trying to crawl over the fence too. So I went and pulled up because when I walked back up to them, they bring in and crossed the fence again. And when they crossed the fence, um, I drove up there to see if their parents were there. Well, their parents was there, and it was two Mexican men. And I said, you need to teach your sons to be more respectful because they were being very disrespectful and talking to me in ways that I didn't appreciate, especially in front of my daughter. And so did you, you drove off after that? Yes, sir. Hit it back. So she tells the police when she's talking to them that it may be something there's this thing going on at the park that uh, involves these three Mexican boys. She knows that has nothing to do with She knows that has nothing. But instead, she starts talking about these other people that it could be. Here's her next statement. Been through the alley? Yeah, because I felt somebody, like somebody was following me. So you thought somebody was following you yes. from the park? No, I don't know from the park. I wasn't paying that much attention because they were complaining that they were thirsty and they were hungry and all this. So I was just consoling them, telling them we're going to be home. You know, the roast is done. Um, basically, Destiny was the one that was talking. So when did you first think that somebody was following you? When I turned um, left off over Highway onto Shaw Road. So what kind of vehicle was that? I'm not sure. It was a dark colored car. I'm, I'm not sure. So you just think a dark colored car is yes, following at that time? Yes, sir. But you just, and you still you go straight on home? Yeah, but I went through the alley, and when I went through the alley, nobody was behind me, so I didn't think nothing of it. So, so when did you, so this dark colored car that you thought was following you, when did you not see it following you? Um, when we stopped at the red light on Callahan, they went behind me. Callahan like Callahan and Clinton. Central. That's Central. Callahan and Central by the Wilders. So right there by the Wilders and I guess a couple of restaurants and stuff that you didn't see anymore at that point. Where Asian Cafe used to be, correct. So you didn't see a car anymore at that point. Correct. And then you go on to your house. Correct. And again, here she is telling these police officers who she has made them think that there is a homicide of this child about Maybe you need to be looking into this other car that I believe to follow you. When she knows, she knows this has nothing to do with anything that happened in this Her next statement. 
she's going to start talking about Anton. Now, the defense wants you to think, well, oh, the only reason that she said it was Anton is because these police officers overbore her will and made her say it. And that is just not true, ladies and gentlemen. They were looking at a story that wasn't making sense. <coughs> wasn't making sense to them. That some unknown person would just come and get this job. And now they have her saying that she can see this black Chrysler from a place they know she can't do that. And then they have her trying to get rid of her phone and putting it under water. And so they look at what's available, the police reports, and they say there is a domestic history of this Anton guy. So to them, is this what this is about? And they ask her that. Now, does she have to say, oh yeah, I was Anton? Does she have to do that? No. No. Miss Howington is responsible for the things she does and the things she says. She could have told these officers, no, Anton has nothing to do with this. But she chose not to do that. This is what she says. So why didn't you tell us that earlier? Because, I mean, this is his daughter, too. I know that he killed her, but I just don't feel like he did it on purpose. I feel like he was trying to kill me. So he was already there. Do you hear me? What, what happens? He tried to talk. He came in the house. And when he came in the house, I told him I didn't want to talk to him. And he went back outside of the house. Right. Then what happened? Then he came back in. He brought Bill back in with him. Yes. So is this gun that Kelly gave you, how long have you had it? Not very long. And it was in the house tonight? No. That gun never was in the house tonight, that's what you're saying. So, with that being said, if we told you there was a gun found outside, and we want to make sure that it's not the gun you said Kelly gave you. Would you mind giving us DNA so we can make sure it's not? I don't understand what you're saying. So there's a gun found outside. Right. You said Kelly gave you a gun at some point. Right. We want to make sure that that's not the gun that Kelly gave you. The way we do that is DNA. You mind giving us your DNA so we can make sure that's not the gun? I'm saying Kelly did give me that gun. Yeah. I know that. Okay. And you're saying you don't know where that gun is at now. Correct. All right. But there was a gun outside your house. Correct. So to make sure that that's not the same gun that Kelly gave you, we'll run your DNA against the DNA found on that gun. Do you mind if we get DNA? No, so that, we do that. I guess it is the gun that Kelly gave me. Yeah. He told me he put it outside. He was supposed to put it in storage. So now, first of all, she throws Anton completely under the bus. He came in and he murdered this child in cold blood. That's what she tells the officer. She goes so far as to circle him in a lineup, circle his face, and say, this is the person that killed the child. Now, is she doing that to protect Gavin like she wants you to do? Or is she doing that to protect herself? And then, when the police confront her, because they've found out from the officers on the scene that there's a gun that's outside the house, she doesn't say, okay, I put it out there. She says, oh, there was a gun in my house. Is it the one outside? I don't know. And then she says, oh, Callie put the gun outside. Which absolutely is the truth. We know that. So this story is Anton brings the gun inside. He leaves, comes back, excuse me, Anton came into the house, leaves, comes back in with the gun and then shoots Destiny. And we know that's not true because we've seen the video. Nobody comes in the house and leaves and comes back in. That just didn't happen. This is a complete lie. And then she changes her story yet again. How are we supposed to believe that? I'm not saying you didn't. Why would you not say that initially? 
Because it's my baby. I don't know what you're going to do. He's in charge to your baby, so that's what he's going to charge to you. He could be going to charge to your baby. No. So now she's saying, you haven't got a hold of the gun. That's the honest to God truth. She's swearing this is what happens. And, more importantly, she's saying Anton is still there. Why is it so important for Miss Howington to say that someone else is there? Why does she say Anton's still there, ladies and gentlemen? Why does she say that? Because she knows that if Anton was there, that's somebody she can blame. That's somebody she can blame for how that gun is out for a child kid. And she is so desperate at this point in time to not be in trouble for her actions that she is willing to circle Anton's picture in a lineup and say that this person murdered her child. That's what she does. And when they say to her, after she changes her story, that this is, you know, after she changes it and says to Gavin, hey, you almost had us arrest this guy for first degree murder? What did she say about that? She doesn't say, oh yeah, you're right, that's crazy. She doesn't show any remorse. She doubles down and talks about how much she doesn't like it. That's the mindset of this individual who's involved in this case. So here we have a story, Gavin got a hold of the gun, Antoine is there, well, that's gonna change. Now we're on the following day. You need to fix the road store in here, mm -hmm. or get it out to see if they need to go back to the um, home. I didn't actually turn it off, but it was um, it was definitely mm -hmm. just like that. And Antoine came to the door, and he was screaming and hollering about Tally yet again. Like, I don't know what the hell he has against Tally, but he got to screaming and hollering about Tally. And we got to argument, and you know, we kind of tussled a little bit, and I asked him to please leave. And he was like, oh, I know what you're going to do. You're a police call, bitch. You're going to call the police, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So he left. And then when I went to the kitchen, Gavin went into my room, and Destiny was laying on the couch watching Netflix. And I came back and sat down, and... So now in this story, Antoine had been there, there had been a scuffle, there had been a tussle. He leaves, and in this story, Gavin goes in the bedroom while she's in the kitchen, gets the gun, and then comes back in and shoots Destiny. And then here's her final story. This is the last thing that she tells the police on September 17th of 2019. Okay. Was Antoine already there when you got home? The neighbor said he had been there. Remember when I said I yeah. want you to, I want you to tell me stuff that you hadn't told me before? Yes, he left. You need to tell me that. He got out of the car and I left. Okay. Let's keep on going. And I asked Destiny what she wanted to eat and he kept trying to interfere. And so and he don't like her to eat me. So that was the problem right there. Anything that I do that he could find a problem with, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So he, don't, he didn't want her to eat me first off, so he started on that shit too. And he just continued to scream and holler and raise his voice. And he went, I thought he was leaving. He went in the living room, so I was like, please leave. And he didn't leave, and I don't know, I felt threatened because I didn't know what the hell he was capable of. I mean, he was beating me to the point where I was unconscious. And I went out the gun when I got it, he got it from me. Where was he going? It was in the black bag on the back of the door. It was in the black bag on the back door and you got it out? On the back of my bedroom door, yes, yeah, sir. So now we still have, this is Anton, this is Anton's fault. What does she admit? What does she finally admit after blaming everybody else? In this version, she admits that she went and got the gun out of a black bag that was in the house. Now she's still
still wants to throw in this Anton's fault and all this other stuff. But what did we hear yesterday? Anton's not even there. He's not even there. He doesn't have anything to do with this. But here in this version, she finally admits that she's the one that went into the bedroom and got the gun not from the top of the closet, but from her purse that's on the back of the door. So I want to talk about not just her changing story of who did this, but I want to talk about some other things. And the reason that these things are important to these children is because what you are going to see and what you've heard in this case is a pattern of blaming other people and not taking any responsibility whatsoever until Ms. Howington is confronted with things that she cannot get away from. And then she finally says, she has some responsibility, just like she did here. She has all these stories, and it's not till the last story. When, again, she's not telling the whole truth. But in the last story, she finally says, I'm the one that went in the bedroom and got the gun. So now we're going to talk about where did the gun come from. And so it's important for her, because, again, she knows she's negligent. It's important for her to tell the police that this gun is secure and put away and somewhere where a child shouldn't have access. So her story to the police is that this gun is in the top of the closet. And she gives many versions about how it comes out of the top of the closet that are inconsistent with each other. But she wants them to believe that the gun in her home is in the top of the closet because again, she doesn't want there to be any responsibility on her part. So let's go through her statements about how the gun came into the room. We, we heard her last statement about her going to get it. But let's, let's walk through kind of the, the different statements she gives about this. First, let's try this. We'll, we'll go back to true story because you said he knew where the gun was. So, so where were you going from that? When you said he knew where he the gun was. He knew where the gun was because he came in my room one day when he just showed up and he seen it in the closet when I was getting my clothes out to get dressed. Okay, so how does that factor into tonight? That's where he went out there from. So you tell me he went and got that gun, and that's the gun he used. And he threw it down after he shot his child. And you picked it up, and you took it out to the bush, and you've done something possibly with the shell casing. No, I didn't touch So it's probably somewhere in your house. So in that statement, she's saying that Anton gets the gun out of the top of the house. She gives all these details about what's happening surrounding her, and then she changes that. The next thing she's going to say is that her two-year-old gets a stool from inside of the living room, drags it the whole way through the room to her bedroom, climbs up on the stool, and gets a gun from the top of the closet. Because again, she wants the police to think that she has responsibly secured this gun, that she's put it in the top of the closet. Her kids shouldn't have access. Not true. But here she's saying Gavin gets the gun out of the closet and that she saw him take the stool across the room and do, and do that. Um, is this putting squat on in here? Okay. No, you're thinking it's stronger than the Okay. You, you went through and tell us what happened prior to what happened when you encountered. Did you see him moving the stool? 
Yes. Let's go back. Let me off the point. I'm going to get as a two year old. So in this version, she is saying that she saw Gavin hit the stool, take the stool, chew the closet, climb up. I don't suppose she says she saw him climb up in the stool. But what he would have had to do is climb up in the stool and get the gun from the top of the closet. That's the walkthrough that happens in September 4th early of September 15th. And so then we have her come in just a couple days later, September 17th of 2019. Here's what she says. The officer is going to ask her, did you see him get the gun out of the closet? Move his you stool. saw him get the stool. Now you're saying you didn't see him get the stool. So there's, there's I can make a mistake, correct? You can make a mistake, but I would think that that wouldn't be, you know, a mistake you made right there, right? It, and so he... Detective Wardlaw says to her, you told us before that you saw him get the gun, and, or excuse me, saw him get the stool, and now you're saying that you didn't. She says, oh, I made a mistake. That's not a mistake that you made. She is lying. And the reason it's important, as I've said before, for her to lie about this is because she knows that the poli police need to be thinking that that gun is in the top of the closet. Because that's the only way she's not negligent. And because of what she says, Gavin has to get measured. Officer Tonkin there, they've got a gun there, he's reaching up, he's 45 inches. He's not tall enough to reach a purse in the top of the foot. And then what does she say finally? Her last statement to the police. After she's blamed it on Anton, after she's blamed it on Gavin going in the top of the closet, what does she say? We're arguing, and I got the gun, and he got it from me, and Charlie. I got the gun. That's what she says there. I got the gun. <clears throat> Where did the gun come from, ladies and gentlemen? Where did the gun come I should probably mention, too, September 12th, a couple days before this, this is part of her story that she's telling. She starts with saying that there's this tussle and all this other stuff that's happening with Callie and with Anton and her. And finally, this is her final version. Not she had said before different things, but this is the last thing she says about September 12th. And so Callie never pulled a gun. Did she? Right. Okay. That Callie never pulled a gun on Anton. It was her that pulled a gun on Anton. She finally admits that well into this interview, September 17th. How does the gun end up outside? We've heard some, some of her explanations. I'm gonna walk through the litany of things she says about this. First, she's like, what gun? I don't have a gun. I don't have a gun in the house. Huh? watch this. Um, did you want a gun? Never had a gun? Do you want to surprise you if you told me that gun was found outside the house? That would surprise you. Why not? Yes, it would surprise you. I'm First scared. she says, no, I don't have a gun. I don't, I don't have a gun. That would surprise me. Then she says. No. no. Where's it at? Wherever you put it. Callie, Callie had a gun. I guess it does where he put it. Callie, Callie's the one that put the gun outside the house, is what she's saying. She comes up here on the stand yesterday and wants to say Callie's the one. Callie's the one that was negligent. Callie's the one that put the gun in the house. And she didn't bother to look for it. Here she is playing with Callie. What's next? So between the time when the shooting happened and you called 911, the police got there. What did you do? I sat there and held the towel, my baby. You never like went outside or tried to get rid of anything? Because that's a, you know. No, she never went outside. She never tried to get rid of anything. I don't know. I guess he's the one that took it outside. I don't know. I don't know. She says Anton took the gun outside. 
But why did you feel like you needed to take that side? I didn't realize that she was shocked till after the fact. And then finally she says, she took the gun outside. But here she says, I didn't realize that she had been shot until after I took the gun outside, which we know is not true. Because she's taken the gun outside on the phone with 911. So she's finally admitting that she took the gun outside, but she's still telling lies about how that happened. Well, this is You all will have these clips. I'm not going to belabor this point, but in this version, she says, I took the damn gun outside and didn't know what to do. So she finally admits she took the gun outside. Gun up. Simple fact of was this gun used to kill Destiny? Who's the gun that was used to kill Destiny? She tells lies about that as well. So the gun that we found outside that Kelly gave you, we test fire the gun. It's not going to match anything with this. No. Have you ever even shot a gun before? No. So you don't know how to use a gun? No. So what's the chances that you were scared today and you had the gun? You shot by mistake. No. So didn't that. No, sir. You never got you never got the gun until after you called 911 and you thought that you'd get in trouble for that. Right. So you're sticking with the fact that Antoine did this. Yes. So here she's saying the gun that's outside is not the gun that was used to kill Destiny, which we know is not true. Then she changes her story, but she's still blaming Anton. Is that deal the murder weapon? I'm just asking. If it is, tell us it is. If it's the, if it's the weapon he used now and you took it outside, tell me the truth. Is it the murder weapon? Because I think we've got ballistics and we're going to be able to take it. I want you to hear it from your mouth. I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Do you want this gun? Yes, do you want to kill? Yes, that's the gun that was used to kill Destiny. But she's still blaming Antoine. And I submit to you what she's doing here. And throughout all of these interviews, as I said before, it is that she makes up stories, she deflects everything from Robin Hallington, and it's not until she is confronted with evidence or like here, we're going to do ballistics on this guy, but she finally tells the truth. The last thing I want to do, ladies and gentlemen, is I want to go through the elements of this offense. You all heard in Ward Dyer that uh, what the state of Tennessee has to prove in this case, we have the burden of proving this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We talked in Ward Dyer about what that means. You all recall we talked about how the state has to prove the elements of the offense beyond the reasonable doubt. And so I want to walk through briefly the elements of the charged offenses in this case. The first offense that the defendant is charged with is felony murder. I anticipate you will hear from the court and you all will have these instructions back in the jury room. So uh, if you want to take notes, obviously you can, but you will have this information back in the jury room is that the defendant, or one for whom the defendant is currently responsible, unlawfully killed Destiny and Oliver. And two, that the killing was committed in the perpetration of, or the attempt to perpetrate, the alleged aggravated child neglect. That is, that the killing was closely connected to the alleged aggravated child neglect, and was not a separate and distinct and independent event. And then finally, the defendant intended to commit the alleged aggravated child neglect. So those are the elements the state has to prove in this case beyond a reasonable doubt in order for you all to find the 
defendant guilty of felony murder. And we'll come back to that in just a second because basically what this is is, is that the state has to show the defendant or someone she's criminally responsible for unlawfully killed Destiny Oliver. Okay? And we know that that is the case here. And then also we have to prove the defendant intended to commit aggravated child neglect. And we have to prove the aggravated child neglect. And these are the elements for aggravated child neglect. First, that the defendant knowingly neglected a child, Destiny Oliver, so as to adversely affect her health and welfare. And ladies and gentlemen, the death of this child is an adverse effect on her health and welfare. It could be less. She, you can have aggravated child neglect where a child is seriously, seriously, seriously injured and not dead. But obviously, the ultimate adverse effect on your health and welfare is when somebody is deceased. And so clearly that element has been met in this case. <coughs> that the act of neglect resulted in serious bodily injury to the child. Again, serious bodily injury is defined under the law to include death. And it's undisputed in this case that Destiny Oliver is dead. We have shown you beyond reasonable doubt that second element. And that the child in this case was eight years of age or less. And we've heard testimony in this case that Destiny was five years old. We heard about her birthday, October. And we gave the exact date and the exact day. Five-year-old child. And so the state has proved, in this case, all of these elements. And we're going to ask you to find her guilty of aggravated child neglect. That's the second count. The third count is similar to the second count. She's not going to be punished twice for the same thing. But it's another theory of what happened. And under the law, the first element's exactly the same. The third element's exactly the same. But this time, because there's a deadly weapon involved, we're going to ask you to find her guilty because there is a deadly weapon that was used to accomplish this act, the firearm in this case. The defendant is also guilty of false report. She initiated a report or a statement to law enforcement concerning an offense or an incident within the officer's concern. And so there are many false reports <coughs> in this case. But we are required to elect for you which specific false report that we're talking about so that we can have a unanimous verdict. And so in this particular uh, case, we're going to ask for you all to focus on her report to Detective Riddle that an unknown male shot her daughter. And we submit to you that that is something that is absolutely false. And the defendant knew the information relating to the offense reported was false. We ask you to find her guilty of that offense. She is also charged with tampering with evidence. Count four has to deal with the firearm in this case. So she tampered with the phone, she tampered with the firearm. So count four, we're dealing with the count firearm. Five. Count five. Count five, excuse me, thank you. Count five, the firearm. The defendant knew an investigation was pending and was in progress, and the defendant concealed a firearm with the intent to impair its availability as evidence in this investigation. She took that firearm, she took it outside, into the dark, while on the phone with 911, put that firearm under the bush, and then called her friends and asked them to come meet it. Clearly tampering with evidence. <coughs> And then finally, attempted tampering with evidence. We're talking about here the cellular phone. The defendant knew an investigation was pending, it was in progress, and the defendant, there's gonna be a, a definition of attempt, and then you're gonna have this definition. So basically, what we're doing here is we're talking about an attempt. So we're saying the defendant attempted to alter a cellular phone with the intent to impair its availability, its evidence and investigation. What did we hear that she did in the phone? Even even if we give her the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, that phone's face was broken before any of this happened, she still ran it underwater and tried to give it away to a lady in the bathroom. And that is very clearly meets this definition of attempted tampering with evidence. We ask you to find her good people. So I want to go back really quick and talk for just a minute about felony murder. Because I think sometimes when people hear the word felony murder, they think, oh, murder. When we hear the word murder, most people think an intentional act. Somebody did something on purpose. Somebody did something premeditated. That's not what we're talking about here in this case. Okay? These are the elements. It doesn't have to be premeditated. It doesn't have to be on purpose, intentional. What we have to show is that 
there was an aggravated child neglect and the child died. And that those things were not separate and distinct. She died because of the neglect in this case. Because that gun being in a place where her child had access to it. So the last thing I want to say to you all before I sit down is that the defendant has gotten up on the stand and she has now given her version her newest version. After five years of this case pending, she has now come up on the stand and given her version of what happened. And I submit to you that even if you take every single thing that she said as the gospel truth, which I don't think it would be unreasonable for you not to do that, but even if you did, if you took everything that she said on the stand as the truth, she has admitted on this stand that there was a gun in her house. In her version of events, she has no idea where it is. And it is left in her house for two days in a place that her two-year-old child could find it in two minutes, three minutes, while she's outside. That's her version that she's telling now. And so again, even if you take everything she says as the gospel truth in this case, she has committed this offense. She is guilty of these, these crimes. And we're going to ask you all that whenever you go back, look at the evidence, think about how she was acting throughout the course of this investigation, and that you hold her responsible. Hold her responsible.